Welcome to the living room of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Uh, we're continuing our series of interviews with Goldman School faculty. We have here today Associate Professor of Public Policy, Sarah Anzia. Sarah is an expert in a variety of different fields, including pensions, uh, the timing of elections, and women in politics. Sarah, so you've written on women in politics and written some of the important articles summarizing what we know about that field. Tell us about the recent election. We had a woman going against a man. Did Hillary Clinton get hurt by the fact that she was a woman? Well, you're starting with a polarizing question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, for Hillary Clinton, we don't know, because this is one woman, and she's unusual. Um, there was certainly a lot of uh, discussion leading up to the to actual election day that there was sexism in the way um, she was covered by the media during the debates and so on. Uh, but as far as what did this mean when people went to the ballot box, we don't know. Um, I can say that more generally, in the research on women in politics, there's some debate about whether women face a penalty running for, for office. Um, a lot of the work that's gone on in this women in politics literature has been focused on one question. Why are there so few women in elective office? And um, you might think, well, a big reason is that voters are biased against women. Um, but it's not actually clear whether they are. So if you actually look to the existing research, the answer that is put forward is actually no. It doesn't seem like voters are biased against women um, when they go to cast their votes. But actually, the, the basis for that conclusion is somewhat fragile. Most of what's been done has looked at the vote shares of um, male and female candidates running for similar offices and, and has found that actually their vote shares on average are about the same. And they've concluded, therefore, that there's no bias against women. But there's an inferential problem there, which is that, well, what if it takes more for a woman to, a woman to actually become a candidate? What if she feels like she has to be more qualified in order to run? Well, then if the average woman who decides to run for office is more qualified or more experienced than the average man, and they get the same vote shares, that's actually evidence that there is bias against women. Um, it's not evidence of the absence of bias. So is the average woman typically more qualified than the average man? There are a few studies that suggest that, that is, there is some of that going on, at least when it comes to national offices. Um, but still, I think more research needs to be done on this topic. We know very well that stereotyping exists, that women, female candidates are seen as more liberal, they're better in certain issue areas um, than others. But I think that to really answer this question well, we need to study um, more elections, different kinds of elections, um, and the context in which women may be disadvantaged. Let's go back to qualifications, though. In what ways would women perhaps be more qualified than men, typically? How would you measure that? Well, that's one of the problems, actually. How do you measure the quality of a candidate? The standard way of doing it in the past has been, have they held prior office? Um, you know, were they in the state legislature? Now, that's pretty crude, actually. Because what does being a quality candidate actually mean? Well, it's sort of nuanced, and that's one of the challenges. One of the studies, um, one of the studies I worked on, looks at sort of uh, women's behavior once they're elected, and finds that the women who are elected to Congress, um, who are in Congress, actually fare better on certain important measures, perform better than um, their average male peers, such as. Um, securing more federal funding for their districts, they're co-sponsoring and sponsoring more bills. Another study looks at, uh, actually asks political experts about to evaluate male and female candidates and finds that actually, um, on average, the female candidates are um, rated somewhat more higher quality than the comparable male candidates. So this is a really difficult thing to do, though, and that's one of the reasons it's so hard to come to a firm conclusion. But, but nobody's come up with any evidence that, in fact, women are advantaged. It sounds like the question is, are they just the same as men, or are they disadvantaged? Well, I, th I don't think there's a one size. My guess, um, and I, like I'm saying, I think we need to have a lot more research on this topic, but my guess is that it depends on the context. For example, if women are seen as uh, m more competent in areas like education, well, then in school board elections, perhaps being a female candidate works to your advantage to the extent that voters are using stereotypes in making their decisions. Um, it may be that to the extent that voters are prioritizing collaborative skill um, or a collaborative approach and women are seen as more collaborative, that might create an advantage. Now, 
So my sense is that when women are running for executive offices, where like mayor, like governor, like president, it may be more difficult for women to overcome these sort of stereotypes to the extent that the stereotypes in those contexts might favor uh, a man. What's your gut feeling though about Hillary Clinton? Do you want to put forth an idea? I mean, do you <laughs> think it hurt her to be a woman? In the I, end? I, I feel confident that it probably, uh, I wouldn't say that it had no effect. And now to, I, I do, it is, it's very clear that certain people wanted to vote for Hillary Clinton because she was a woman and they wanted to see a woman elected president. So there was, there were, there was probably a sizable percentage of the population that wanted to vote for her because she was a woman. Now, um, I also think that there was most likely a sizable percentage of the population that didn't like the idea of voting for a woman for president. They didn't like the idea of a woman commander in chief, um, uh, you know, a female executive. So my sense is that it, it probably did affect her on election day. Um, but figuring out just exactly what that effect was is really difficult to do. So let, let's go one more thing on this. How can we get more? It's certainly demonstrably true that there's not as many women running for office as men. How can we get more women running for office? What needs to be done there? Well, there are a few organizations out there that are trying to uh, recruit women. And it, the research does show that women are more likely to run when they are encouraged. That more so than your average man, women need to be asked, they need to be encouraged to run for office. They're less likely to think of themselves as a great candidate for public office by themselves. And so those strategies, um, in terms of encouraging women to have more political ambition are probably productive. Um, but to the extent that voters have something to do with it, which we're still trying to figure out, well, that's trickier. Um, and I think we need to, know, to learn more about what's actually going on with voters in order, to, in order to think about possible solutions. I mean, I certainly know that the Goldman School, it's been very nice to have uh, former governor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm, around the school because she's, I think, served as a role model for a lot of the female students about, oh my gosh, yes, here's somebody who has been a governor, so maybe I too, as, as a woman, can become uh, a candidate and win an election and even become a governor, or maybe even president. Right. We certainly want to encourage uh, all of our students, not just women, but also the men, to actually bring their public policy school skills into the public arena. The other area you do a lot of research on, in fact, the bulk of your research has to do with pensions, which are a very complicated area. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on with respect to pensions in the public sector in America right now, and what, in broad strokes, what's happening? Okay. So this is really complicated, um, and I'll keep it simple. But first I want to be clear that the research I'm doing is on public employee pensions. So the retirement benefits, the defined benefit plans that government employees get. Virtually all state and local government employees get a defined benefit plan or a traditional pension. So a defined benefit is when you put money in and then you know exactly what you're going to get out at the end in terms of a benefit. And that's in distinction to a defined contribution where you know how much you're going to put in, but you don't know how much you're going to get out because that depends upon how the money does once it's invested. Is that That's right? That's right. So a defined benefit plan works as follows. Employees and employers contribute money. Um, that money is pooled, invested, and the resulting pot of money is used to pay retirement benefits to the beneficiaries. Now, as a beneficiary, you get a defined benefit for as long as you live. Every year, you get the same amount or you get a specified amount. Um, if and there isn't enough money to pay those benefits, somebody has to make up for the shortfall. You get that benefit. You're guaranteed that benefit for as long as so you live. So that's the virtue of, from the employee's perspective of a defined benefit program yes. because they know what they're going to get when they retire, whereas the defined contribution program, you don't know because it really depends upon how well those funds you've contributed into the fund do. That's right. And I think the other um, important thing to keep in mind is that, well, first of all, the employee's benefit when you get an, a defined benefit plan is determined by a multiplier. So you get a certain percentage of your final average salary times the number of years of service, um, and then there's a certain retirement age. So that it's a formula. A defined contribution plan, there's no formula. You make contributions, your employer probably matches it, and then whatever is, you know, what, that money's invested, whatever is in that pot of money when you retire is what you get for retirement, the end. If you run out of money, that's your problem. Um, and so this is a it's very the different, problem. it's the employee's problem. Whereas the risk for a defined benefit plan is borne by uh, the employer and the taxpayers, not the employee who is retired.
Okay, and so what are some of those risks? What are some of the problems that have occurred with uh, defined benefit programs? Okay, well, I think it's helpful to think about um, two major problems that uh, have happened over the course of several decades. First of all, it's very tempting to say that this is a problem caused by the Great Recession. Um, and I think that that is a mistake. Certainly the Great Recession had something to do with it, but these problems have been going on for a very long time. The first problem is that over the last couple of decades, at least, governments have sweetened the benefits, okay? So it's very tempting for government officials to sweeten the pension benefits, increase the multiplier, lower the retirement age, um, you know, change the vesting requirements. Now, of course, as you increase pension benefits, they become more expensive. You should be setting aside more money to pay for those benefits. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is and that- a, And it's a problem because sometimes governments promise the benefits, but they don't put aside the money. That's exactly right, and that's where I was going. I, and I should add that once governments increase the benefits, those increases for the most part are permanent. They cannot be rolled back for current employees, even for years that those current employees have not yet worked in most places. So it's the only way in, in which benefits can be reduced in the future is for people who have not yet been hired, okay? Mm -hmm. So the reason that increasing these benefits has been uh, a problem is that technically, as soon as the benefits are increased, governments and employees should be setting aside more funds to pay for those benefits um, because pensions are supposed to be pre-funded. Employees and employers set aside money today for the benefits that are being earned today um, in order to have enough money in the future to pay those benefits. But they haven't done that, not by a long shot. Um, so the second problem, and it is related, is that governments have failed to set aside enough money to pay for the benefits that have been promised, and now there are big shortfalls. And keep in mind that these benefits are legally guaranteed. There's a defined benefit, so if there is a shortfall, somebody has to make up for that shortfall, uh, whether that's employers, employees, and or taxpayers, okay? Um, because those benefits are guaranteed. So now state and local governments are having to make greater and greater contributions, a greater and greater share of their budgets to pay, to, you know, to pay for the more expensive benefits and the shortfalls that have been accruing over the last couple of decades. And we have a generation that's starting to retire that's the baby boom, boomer generation. So there's a lot of people retiring right now. So there's big obligations that have to be met by these pension plans for which there may not be enough money. That's right, that's right. And the projections for different governments vary. When do they project that they will run out of money? Um, this is part of the reason this is so difficult, though, politically. Usually, the funds aren't gonna run out of money next year or in five years. Usually, they're saying, we're gonna run out of money in 15 years or 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, politicians in office now aren't going to, f First of all, politicians typically don't want to, say, double the contributions to the pension fund because that takes away money from other things that they care about, mm -hmm. like policies, programs that they are in favor of, or maybe cutting taxes. Um, and so the idea of suddenly shoring up the pension fund with huge contributions is really, really unappealing for your typical mm -hmm. politician. Um, Let but this, somebody worry about that in the future. Yes, exactly. And if we keep just not contributing enough money, sure, eventually that'll be a problem. Eventually the funds will run out of money. But by the time eventually rolls around, those politicians are long gone and it becomes a new generation of politicians and taxpayers problem to worry about. Mm -hmm. And so this is a severe problem. There's lots of places where this is becoming problematic. So it's led to bankruptcies for some cities, yes? Yes, so um, there have been, bankruptcies are still pretty recent and pretty rare. Detroit, Stockton, Vallejo, Central Falls, Rhode Island. There are cases where um, the local governments have gone bankrupt and pensions played a role in each of those cases. Now, um, I think there's been some debate about how widespread is this problem? How much pain is this causing for state and local governments? And you have two sides to this. Some, some scholars say, well, this is affecting governments everywhere, um, and this is creating really difficult decisions. What are you gonna do with pensions, um, you know, pension costs growing? Well, either you try to curtail the growth in pension costs, you increase revenues, you cut spending in other areas, or you issue more debt to prolong the problem, kick the can down the road. And some scholars say, this is everywhere, this is affecting everybody. Others say, it's just a few bad apples. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's Chicago. What's um, your judgment? San Diego. Is it just a few bad I'm apples? doing some research on this now to try to answer this question. Um, and I'm looking at a, um, a set of over 200 cities of different sizes, so ranging from small to very large. Um, and I've dug into their comprehensive annual, annual financial reports over the last 10 years to see how much are they spending on pension costs. So you've costs. really got to dig into the data here oh, and yes. figure out what's going on. This is part of the problem. It's very hard to get. And your summary judgment to this point is? To this point, the average growth in real pension contributions in the average city is, has been 69% over 10 years. Okay, Now, that's the average. 69% growth in contributions to so pensions. So that's cities trying to solve their problem by making contributions, but that doesn't tell you whether that's been enough. That's right. Just that's tells exactly you they, right. They're beginning to see there's a problem, but we don't know whether that's enough or not enough. That's right. This doesn't tell us whether they're changing to um, uh, contributions that would be sufficient to get full funding over time. And the truth is that um, it's probably not because most of these pensions still aren't being governed. So you think this is a ticking time bomb? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. And so, okay, so who created this ticking time bomb? Uh, usually you would say, well, it's obviously the party that likes to spend and tax, which would be the Democrats. So it's the Democrats' fault, right? Okay, no, um, you might think. So um, it's everybody's fault. So um, in terms, again, here it's helpful to separate the politics of benefits from the politics of funding. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to benefit, uh, making pe pension benefits more generous, that's usually the job of state legislatures. State legislatures from 1999 to 2008 were expanding benefits, making them more um, generous. And if you look at who voted in support of those benefit increases, you might think, oh yes, it's the Democrats who are friends of public sector unions um, and are friends of labor and um, favor more taxing and spending who would vote yes for this. And Republicans should have held the line and voted no because they're no friend of public sector unions and they like to keep government small. Well, I think you need to think more carefully about that statement, first of all, um, because what are the politics of increasing pension benefits? All right, well, who's in favor of that? Clearly, government employees want more gener generous pension benefits. Clearly, um, public sector unions want more generous, generous pension benefits. Well, what are the interest groups on the other side saying we need to hold the line on pension benefits? Up until 2009 or so, there weren't any. So who was there to reward Republicans for voting no on these very quiet issue, the very quiet issue of pension benefits. Nobody. There were no interest groups. And nobody Pres rewarded Democrats That's either, right. for that matter. That's right. And for Republicans, then, you can think, well, there was a cost to opposing the interests of public sector unions who could put up a challenger in their next election, potentially. Um, there was no benefit for voting no. And so what you see is looking at these state legislative votes on pension benefits, Republicans and Democrats were voting together. There's one last thing I want to emphasize um, on the Republican side in terms of their incentives. I think when people think of labor and unions, they think of manufacturing workers in certain districts in certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong way of thinking about labor in this context. Even Republicans have government employees in their districts. Mm -hmm. We're talking about teachers, police officers, firefighters. They're in every district. And so even Republicans have an important constituency in their district who's very active on the pension issue giving them reason to not vote no on increases to pension benefits. So the answer is they all did it together. So we have a, we have a problem here, we, and it seems to have a lot to do with politicians who are myopic. Mm -hmm. They look to today, they forget about tomorrow, because that's going to be somebody else's problem. You've done some other work that suggests the problem is exacerbated when there are off-cycle elections. What do you mean by that, and what's the problem? Okay. Um, well. Off, and most people don't realize that we have almost 90,000 governments in this country, and most of them hold their elections at times other than National Election Day, November of even-numbered years. They hold their elections in November of odd-numbered years or in the spring. And when cities and school districts hold their elections on days other than National Election Day, turnout is much, much lower. Take a city in California that holds its election uh, off cycle. Mm -hmm. Compared to that same city election held in presidential, during a presidential election, turnout might be 35, 36 percentage points lower. So it's a big effect on turnout. And when you get a change in turnout that big, that affects the composition of the electorate. And what you see is looking at 
comparing governments that hold elections off cycle to those that hold their regular elections on cycle, what you can see is that interest groups actually have a bigger influence in these off-cycle local elections. So the public the employee unions make sure their voters go to the polls in the off-cycle elections and become a larger fraction of the total electorate, so they have more influence on the results, which means yeah. that those governments are maybe more likely to be generous with respect to pensions. Potentially. So I think, it, you know, there's some nuance here. So first of all, the, the ability for off-cycle election timing to help interest groups helps not just public sector unions, it can help a variety of interest groups. In my own research, I've shown that this definitely, in, on average, creates advantages for public sector unions. And it's not just in terms of the actual votes of government employees, but also their supporters, right? The, their ability to mobilize. Every vote, supportive vote they mobilize in an off-cycle election with low turnout has a bigger impact on the election outcome than in an election where turnout is high. Um, and so, yes, who are the elected officials going to be responsive to? Of course, the people who are voting in their elections, the organized groups that are active in their elections. But let's go to another example, yeah. too. Take Ferguson. You wrote an, uh, an op-ed piece about Ferguson and how off-cycle elections maybe had ha created part of the problem that existed there. And the problem, as I understand it, was that you had a police force that was primarily white, did not reflect the community. The community had changed, it had become almost all black, and that may have been contributory to some of the difficulties that occurred there with respect to policing. Yeah, so um, most of the work I've done is not focused on um, the effects of turnout on the racial or ethnic composition of the electorate. There are a couple of people who've done extensive work on this. Um, the main idea, though, that has been the focus of my research is that when you change election timing, turnout goes down and the electorate is, not, is going to be less representative of the people in that community. And that was very much the case in, or it seemed that it was very much the case in Ferguson, because Ferguson held its elections off cycle, even though you have a majority African American city. Only one of its city council members up till the time of the protests was African American. How can that happen? And the answer is hold your election off cycle, keep turnout down, and then white voters make up a larger share of the electorate. And this was just tradition. It wasn't that anybody was trying to be malevolent necessarily. They just traditionally had held the elections then, but the net result was a lag in responsiveness of the elected officials to the constituents in that particular area because the constituents changed but the elected officials didn't. That's right, so, um, yes, that's right. So, it's not that these are bad people doing bad things. Most cities and most school districts do hold their elections off cycle. This dates back to the progressive era, um, and there were some good intentions for that switch, and some, I would argue, not so good intentions, and in that there is, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that somebody benefits from low turnout. Mm -hmm. Somebody does, and if there are groups that benefit from low turnout, you bet they will show up when it comes time to decide on the timing of the elections, if someone's trying to change the schedule. It's very, I think that most people would respond to this by saying, well, of course then, we know that Democrats are the party that favors higher turnout, and Republicans benefit from turnout being lower, and it's not straightforward. I think oftentimes that's the case. Um, but what I find actually is if you go to state legislatures and you look at who's proposing changes to election timing. It's not a clear Democratic or Republican um, issue. You get these very strange patterns where when it comes time to change school board elections, for example, Democrats do not want to change elections to on cycle in favor of higher turnout. They actually vote no. Republicans are the ones saying, we want higher turnout. Well, why is that? Because in that particular case, this is a bit strange and I think counterintuitive to people, you have the groups that benefit from off cycle election timing are the Democrats constituents. So what would you recommend? Do you think that we should have more on cycle elections? Would that be good for democracy? Would that be good for public policy? There are trade offs, but yes, I think on net it would be better. Partly just because of the democratic principle that everybody should be represented as much as possible. And if you have on cycle elections, you're going to get a more representative electorate. That's right. That's generally true. Yes, and I think that um, the, the most common argument against moving more elections on cycle is that, well, you want the people who really know something about the election to be voting, not the people who don't know anything about these local offices down ballot. Now here's the tricky thing. When it comes to information, I think it's more complicated than that because if suddenly local elections were held on the same day as presidential elections, 
those groups that are involved in the election would have incentives to try to inform everybody who's going to show up to vote for president or for governor, right? And I think that actually there is a reason to think that more information would be available to voters if th those elections were held on cycle. So as a final question, is there a way to make politicians less myopic? And this shows up not just in this arena, it shows up in underfunding of infrastructure, underfunding of uh, work on climate change. It's so easy to say, well, that's tomorrow. I don't have to deal with it today. I don't have a good answer to that. I think that um, one possibility, I, I, mean, I don't think term limits help the matter. Um, term limits is not an answer because you don't get politicians with much sense of the future. Right. And in fact, they're constantly thinking about their next election, which is probably just the wrong thing to yeah. focus on. I think to some extent that executives like governors and presidents are thinking, are just inclined to think longer term to the extent they care about their legacy. Um, and that they will be remembered for certain achievements, which is why you see Jerry Brown being a bit more aggressive on the pension issue than Democrats in the state legislature, for example. So those are just you know, two possibilities, but I think that this is a fundamental problem of democratic government. Unless you create 20-year terms, <laughs> uh, which of course will have their pitfalls and their disadvantages, it's really difficult to get elected officials to think longer term. Great. Well, that is a fundamental problem, and we're going to have to have an interview another day to see if you have more ideas on how to solve it. My thanks to Sarah Anzia, uh, Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Golden School of Public Policy. Thanks. Thank you.